Could you please stand? remain standing just for a moment as we remind ourselves of those great truths from the Bible. The eternal God is our refuge and underneath are the everlasting arms. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His compassion never fails. Every morning they are renewed. Eye has not seen nor ear heard nor the heart of man conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. Do sit. May I welcome you to St. Simon's as we say our sad farewell to Gordon Peak. Partings are always sad occasions, aren't they? But especially so when we have to say our goodbye to one who's been a key member of the family for many years, many years in Gordon's for eternity. So our thoughts and prayers are especially with Chris, Linda and Andy and their families with Stephanie, cousin Leonard and uh, not forgetting grandchildren and uh, great-grandchildren Sarah and Daniel, Beth and Reese and Bryn, Cece and Sammy, Mary Ann, Adam, Solomon, Isaac and Ellen and any others shortly to arrive. Today gives us the opportunity to uh, thank God for Gordon's long and full life, for his personality, his gifts, his interests, and his service to the community. But it's also a time of reflection on our own mortality and uh, thanking God for the firm assurance that we have in Christ for eternity. So as we sit, let's ask our loving Father to be with us today as we pray. Gracious God, as we gather and share together Gordon's family and friends to celebrate Gordon's life, to express our confidence in the risen Christ and our eternal hope, Strengthen us 
for the trials of this day. May we know your fatherly care to uphold us, the living presence of the Lord Jesus to sustain us, the consolation of your holy word to encourage us, and the power of the Holy Spirit to enable us to persevere. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We're going to stand to sing our first hymn, Be Still for the Presence of the Lord. Let me just say a word about masks. If anybody is more comfortable wearing a mask, that's fine. If you'd rather not wear a mask, that's equally fine. It's your own personal choice. But there's lots of air around, and I think everybody probably be... be uh, safe here. But can I ask you to stand as we sing together, Be Still for the Presence of the Lord. <laughs> still for the presence of the Lord the Holy One is here come bow before him now with reverence and fear in him no sin Psalms 36, verses 5 to 7, say, Your steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the mountains of God, your judgments are like the great deep. Man and beast you save, O Lord, how precious 
is your steadfast love, O God. The children of men take refuge in the shadow of your wings. Micah 6, verse 8. He has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. Romans 13.10 Love does no wrong to a neighbour. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Thank you, Sarah, very much. And now, if you'd like to remain seated, we'll hear Heaven's song and... Uh, that's going to be sung by Bryn and Seth. Thank you. Be coming, coming for me soon. And oh my God, I'll be ready for you. I wanna run on greener pastures. I wanna dance on higher hills. I wanna drink from sweeter waters in the misty morning chill. And my soul is getting restless. For the place where I belong I can't wait to join the angels And sing my heaven song I hear your voice and I catch my breath child and to read and rest tears of joy roll down my cheeks it's beautiful beyond my wildest dreams i want to run on greener pastures i want to dance on higher hills i want to drink from sweeter waters morning chill and my soul is getting restless for the place where I belong I can't wait to join the angels and sing I want to run on greener pastures I want to dance on higher hills I want to drink from sweeter waters in the misty morning chill and my soul is getting restless for the place where i belong i can't wait to join the angels and sing i can't wait to join the angels and sing no i can't wait to join the angels and Thank you so much, Bryn and Steph. It's a great delight now to invite uh, Chris to our uh, lectern, and Chris is going to share about uh, his dad's life. So thank you so much for taking that trouble for us. I'm going to begin with some words that Andy sent over from America. <clears throat> Andy wrote, Dad was always the great pun maker. Lynn remembers her first Christmas in Fleet when he looked around the dining table and said, we're all boxed in, to which everyone groaned. 
And then he turned to Lynn to explain it was Boxing Day. He seemed always to aspire to making a worse pun than the last one. I know he was loved by many for his selfless acts, always taking on chores for those in need and graduating to serving the whole town and area on the health committee. When he came to Roanoke on his last visit 20 odd years ago, he packed his ancient nail extractor in his suitcase as he knew he would be pulling up 400 square feet of deck and redecking in the boiling Virginia sun. One of my fondest memories was going with him to Lasham Airfield one summer where he was programming the tests for Doppler radar landing system using very early computer technology. It was programmed with reels of perforated paper tape, probably an 8-bit code. I used to gather finished reels and throw them out like toilet roll, papering someone's tree, as they do here. We even use them as Christmas decorations in infant school. Dad was an inspiration for rebirthing a career. He never stopped trying new things. This reached new levels when he retired and interviewed for three jobs. A dental hygienist, a school board member, and something to do with Waitrose. Eventually, this led him on to the Fleet Council, where he excelled. Shame about the hygienist, though. I'm sure he would have enjoyed it for a day or two. In my talk today, rather than spend time on a list of dates and things, <clears throat> I want to focus on my impression of Popsy's life, and in particular, to say just how well he did. He was born in 1927 into what must have been difficult circumstances, and his upbringing from the start seems to have been clouded by insecurities. His school record was a bit up and down, and with the coming of the war, it was further disrupted. Once, when I asked him about the Blitz, he told me that his father had been a fire warden and had sent him dashing around on his bike in the middle of it all with messages for the other stations. After the war, he started an apprenticeship at a large electrical works in Mitcham. One of the main jobs he remembered doing there was going round the benches with a large wheelie bin, collecting the metal offcuts so that not a scrap was wasted. But while he was there, he undertook a long, hard slog to make up his qualifications by going to evening classes. Around this time, Ern, his father, finally left the family, moving to an address just around the corner. He felt the betrayal keenly, and I don't think he ever really got over it. Mum used to tell a story of how once she and he were at a shop window somewhere near home, when she noticed Ern a few shops up the street. When she asked to be introduced, he refused point blank and ushered her away in the opposite direction. His father would write to him, but I don't think he ever got a reply, even though Pops kept those letters all his life. Amongst them was a postal order that Ern had sent him as a birthday present. It's still there in the pile with its wishes, birthday wishes letter, uncashed and unacknowledged. At the end of the Mitcham apprenticeship, he was not taken on permanently and so went to Farnborough to get a new apprenticeship with the RAE a move which entailed long bike rides back and forth between the hostel in Farnborough, which had been in grounds behind my old grammar school playing fields, and Carl Shulton, where he continued his courtship of Gladys. It was a lowly start, but eventually, through years of sustained effort, his lifelong career with the RAE culminated in a position as a senior scientific officer working at an international level. In 1953, now married, Gordon and Gladys were thrown out of their small flat because I had arrived. They were given a council house in Cove and that staying power that had got him through the apprenticeship years was now applied to his home and family life. 
Determined to be better than his origins, he made it his life work to be a faithful husband and good father, leading our family not just to get by, but to reach out and achieve. He's left me with many precious memories. On one occasion, <clears throat> I was struggling with some maths homework, just starting to do fractions. I can remember he spent the whole evening, until way past my bedtime, trying to teach me how decimal places worked. Well, it all seemed to make sense as he said it, but I didn't really understand a word. He was always very patient, as well as helpful. But when it came to expressing things emotional, anally retentive doesn't begin to cover it. <laughs> Nevertheless, I always felt that we had an unstated bond. I never doubted him, always trusted him, and felt that somehow we understood each other. I can only remember him losing his temper once. One evening <clears throat> during my grammar school years, he came into my room to find me not doing my homework, surprise, surprise, but reading a copy of The Red Mole, a newspaper that I think Tarek Ali was involved with. He was so upset, he gave me a speech about what the point was of all the work he was doing at the RAE, trying to keep our nation ahead of the communist threat. And then he took the paper, put it in the bin, and went out without a further word. He never knew it, but I had been coming to the conclusion that it was a bit of a rabid rag anyway. I looked at it in the bin, decided it wasn't worth picking it out again, and turned at last to my homework. The incident was never mentioned again. One memorable evening in my college years, I set off to ride a dodgy 50cc motorbike all the way back to Barry in South Wales after a weekend at home. <clears throat> after a number of stops, it finally gave out somewhere near Basingstoke. So I called home for help. <clears throat> out he came in the Zodiac, we put the bike in the boot and he drove me all the way to college. We arrived around 1am, but without demurring, he offloaded me in the bike and then drove straight back home through the small hours. That was Pops. But in the end, it all paid off, as all three of us ended up with degree level qualifications and professional careers. The mid 1960s saw the beginning of the trend for family holidays in France and Spain. And although we didn't have much money, we weren't going to miss out. It must have been 1964 when Pops bought a tent fixed up the old car, created a rack for the spare wheel on top of the boot lid so that everything else would fit inside, and drove us all to what was then the tiny fishing village of Garaf, south of Barcelona, for a glorious fortnight in the sun. In fact, he did it two years in a row. One of the few books I remember being in the house was one called I Bought a Dream by Anne Edwards. Programmatic for that generation, it was the story of how a couple bought a large rundown old house in the country and turned it into a dream home. So the house hunting began. And although we did look at some rundown treasures, in the end they bought a brand new house, not out in the wilds, but in Church Crookham, which was admittedly a bit nearer the wilds then than it is now. In typical Pop's style, he bought the house not quite finished and used flat pack furniture kits to make his own design of partition wall between Andy's room and mine, as well as fitted robes in the other bedrooms. The house also came with an eight foot high pile of dirt in the front garden. The back garden, which had been a pig pen before, had to be dug over and leveled by barrowing through all this dirt until a lawn could be laid. I think I helped. That house became his life project when he designed and helped build the extension that turned it into the family centre we all remember, with its Heath Robinson style extended dining table and beautifully kept garden. It also led 
to a growing commitment to the community of Fleet. Whatever Pops got involved in, and he led a very active life, he wanted to give as well as benefit. He spent many years supporting the RAE Operatic Society, sitting at the back of the assembly hall, managing the microphones and quietly singing along in his headphones before he eventually plucked up the courage to join the chorus. And later, he came out of his shell even more with the Heart Male Voice Choir. But whether it was with these groups or the RE Technical Society or the Matinee Club, which was pretty much his creation, or the various things he got involved in through being a Lib Dem councillor on Heart District Council, he always did more. Even if it did often end up with him being the chairman or some other officer of the committee. It was just his way of doing what he could to make the world a better place. And the roots he and mum put down in fleet go deep and wide. He was always a sober person, never drank or smoked, ate healthily and kept himself well exercised. So. It came as a bit of a car crash when, at about 90 years of age and still living like a 65-year-old, dementia struck them both. Eventually, they just had to leave their beloved home and community to be cared for at Seaview. Yet, even there, his sense of responsibility and determination to care for his wife stood out. In some ways, it pained him not to be able to do what he felt he wanted to do. And we're thankful for the way the staff managed what sometimes must have been confusion about whether he was there as an extra staff member or a resident. Thank you, Seaview staff, for all of your loving care. He lived well, loved unfailingly, and left an example I, for one, won't be able to match. And he showed that even though some things may hang on to haunt you throughout life, you never need to be constrained by the limitations of your origins in this world. Thank you, Pops. We love you. Thank you very much. Well, we've gathered together today to pay tribute to Gordon, who was a truly gifted man, who used his many skills primarily for the benefit of others. So whether it was in local politics or cultural activities, sports clubs or community organisations, Gordon devoted time and energy to those many causes which were dear to his heart. So we can express our gratitude to God today for a valuable life, a life which was well lived. But as the years roll on, strength fades and faculties weaken, and there's a time to lay down some of those roles. As Ecclesiastes says, there's a season for every activity under heaven. For the Christian, that doesn't mean retiring into some humdrum existence, without a goal or purpose. Rather, as the body loses power, shouldn't our spirits be developing a longing for the next phase of life, the next adventure of faith? I was touched by the song that Bryn sang for us, and my soul is getting restless for the place where I belong. I can't wait to join the angels and sing my heaven song. And that seems to me to echo much of the yearning that we find in the New Testament, the earnest desire for heaven and a heartfelt longing to be with our Lord who redeemed us. Paul the Apostle felt that, not knowing whether his ministry was going to be cut short, he declared, I desire to depart and be with Christ which is much better. And later he writes, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which Christ called me 
heavenward in Christ Jesus. Keeping going, that was what Paul felt to await that divine call with our gaze on the Master. Peter, too, he looked forward to an inheritance that could never perish or spoil or fade, but kept safe for us, treasure indeed. The writer of the Hebrews, for we do not have an enduring city, he said, here below. We are looking for a city that is to come. And that's the anticipation, isn't it? That's the longing, folks. of what is to come. That anticipation is well founded in John in Revelation. Marvels at the heavenly city that needs no sun, no noon, because the glory of God gives it light. And Jude exhorted his reading readers to praise him, who is able to keep us from falling and present you, this is Jude speaking, present us without fault and with great joy. How marvellous is that? Leaving behind our sin-stained lives before God and being pure and unblemished. Can we imagine that? What a blessing that is. What a yearning that is. But you could only say that for those who came to our holy God in repentance and expressed that genuine faith in Christ who died in our place on that cross of Calvary to take away our guilt. And it's solely because of Jesus we can have that longing, we can have that yearning, because he said... I am going to prepare a place for you. This is the Lord Jesus saying to us, I am going to prepare a place for you. Where I am, says Jesus, there you may be also. Greeted by the Saviour, welcomed home. What a vision to hold before us and spur us on, especially in sad times. And that transforms our total vision about death. Let's invite Beth and up to pray for us. Thank you. Let's pray together. As we gather to remember Gordon, a man we loved, we thank you, God, for who he was to us and to each other. A son, a brother, a husband, our dad, our pops, our friend. We thank you for who you made him and for the life you gave him, for his marriage to Gladys and Anna and the many happy times they shared together, for his love and care as a father to Chris, Andy and Linda, for the fun and wisdom he brought to the lives of us, his grandchildren and great-grandchildren, who knew him as Pops. For the years of dedication and commitment he gave to his work, and for his many endeavours with his wide circle of friends. We remember the times when we laughed with him and the precious memories we made together. We remember the times when we cried with him and he comforted and consoled us. And we remember the times when some of us consoled and cared for him. We thank you particularly for the loving kindness and careful attention he was shown at the end of his life by the staff at Seaview who cared for him, a dignified and proud man in such a gentle way. For every memory of love and joy, for every good deed done by him, for every sorrow shared with us, for his life and for his death, and for the rest in Christ he now enjoys, we thank you, God. In our sadness, help us to find peace in the assurance of your love and give us light to guide us out of our darkness. We remember the words of Paul in Romans. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, 
nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Be our refuge and strength. Reassure us of your continuing love and lift us from the depths of our grief into the light of your presence as we say goodbye to a man we have loved and lost, but who rests in peace with you now. Let's say together the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. I invite you to stand as we sing in Christ alone. strength my song this cornerstone this solid ground firm through the fiercest drought and storm what heights of love what depths of peace when fears are still when striving cease my comforter my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless faith, this gift of love and righteousness. Scorned by the ones he came to save. Still on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on him was laid. Here in the death of Christ I live. There in the ground his body lay, light of the world by darkness slain, then bursting forth in glorious day. Up from the grave he rose again, still as he stands in victory. Since curse has lost its grip on me, for I am his and he is mine, bought with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death, this is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ, I stand. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand 
till he returns or cause me home here in the power of christ i'll stand from life's first cry to final breath jesus commands my destiny to have him been reminded of that eternal truth. Let's commend Gordon to the mercy of God, our maker and redeemer. Almighty God, as you bring us face to face with our mortality, we thank you for making each of us in your own image and giving us gifts in body, mind and spirit. We thank you now as we honour the memory of Gordon Ernest John whom you gave to us and have taken away. We entrust him to your mercy in the name of Jesus our Lord, who is alive, who, de- who died and is alive and reigns with you now and forever. Amen. So our farewell to Gordon and the committal will follow at Porchester Crematorium. Before that, we'll enjoy a final sung item, please, from uh, Frida Lord be with you. Do sit for that, please. I've written this song, Be Still. It's actually called Be Still, not what was in the actual um, pamphlet, which is very interesting, really, because I didn't know you were going to sing Be Still. It was because when I was thinking about Gordon, I was thinking about the last minutes of his his life. It's not going to be very good singing, am I, at this stage? (laughs) Anyway, and and I was thinking, you know, um, it's the hearing goes, as you know, the last last thing that goes. And I just picture him there in that room listening to the surrounds. And I believe that God was there. This is my idea. <laughs> this is my idea. And, and so I wrote a song about it. I hope I'll be able to sing it.
So our final prayer. May God give you his comfort and his peace, his light and his joy in this world and the next. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you. Would you please stand as the family prepare to escort Gordon to Porchester. Those remaining are invited to share in the buffet.